All right, um, let's uh, continue with our lecture. Uh, there was one more example that I skipped from uh, common sense reasoning, but you can read that in your text about a story that involves a robot with some sensors. And uh, that's more of a traditional storytelling and uh, building the network is completely done uh, based on intuition. So check it out, but I want to uh, make sure that I get through this example or this case study, which is the one from genetic uh, linkage analysis that I already alluded to a number of times. So let me tell you first what is the ultimate objective here before we dig into the details, because to get through this, we need to do a little bit of a review of some uh, background that some of you may have seen or not from uh, genetics. Pretty interesting application. Uh, so so the, the final objective is the following. The idea is you have genes that uh, make up the genotype of an individual and control the phenotype. I'll explain that in a little bit. But the, the idea is uh, these genes could, we're interested in how close they are to each other on a chromosome. That's what we're trying to figure out. Because depending on how close they are, they could be either inherited together or not. Uh, people call this, if they're close, then they're linked. They tend to be inherited together. If they're far apart, then they're not linked. That's the ultimate objective of this exercise. We'll build a Bayesian network and use it to reason about the extent to which two particular genes are linked or close to each other on a chromosome, because that has implications on uh, whether certain things will be inherited together or not. Okay? But to get there, we will basically have to go through, through some background. And again, before going through this background, uh, the overall structure will be that we will build the Bayesian network from three types of information. One, a pedigree, which we'll explain in a little bit now, that tells us about individuals and how they're related and who's the offspring of who, pedigree. Second, phenotype some information about the genetic composition of individuals. And the third is the phenotype, which are the characteristics that are induced by genes like blood type, hair color, eye color, and so on. Right? So these three types of information will come together, will generate a Bayesian network and some evidence on it, and we're going to use that to reason about how close two particular genes are together. And there is A key thing about how inheritance works that's going to play into all of this. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting game. We'll see now. It's like a really Sherlock Holmes kind of thing, you know, trying to put evidence together and make these uh, intriguing conclusions. Okay, so let's start with the pedigree. Uh, here's one. And uh, what's happening here is the uh, squares are males, uh, circles are female, and, and these horizontal edges say couple and vertical offspring. So Jack is the offspring of Mary and, and John, and then Jack and Sue are a couple, and they have Lydia and Nancy, all right? Simple, you have a pedigree like this. And then for each individual, uh, in this case, we're talking about two particular genes, G1 and G2. The one thing I want you to know about now is think of a gene as a variable. And this variable, the value is a pair, right? So uh, G1, in this case, happens to have this pair as its value. But uh, uh, more specifically, uh, a gene may occur in different states called alleles, right? So you just saw the pair. There was like an A and a B, big or small. And those values that appear in the pair are the alleles. So each individual carry two alleles for each gene. Right? Uh, those, this is the pair that you just saw. And one received from their mother and the other received from their father. Right? So there's a pair of alleles. Uh, one basically, uh, as we said, is from the father and the other from the mother. Now, uh, the alleles of an individual are called the genotype, while the heritable characteristic expressed by these alleles, such as hair color, blood type, etc., are called the phenotype. Right? So think of cause and effect, 
right? Uh, the genotype and the phenotype. Let's, let's look at an example. Uh, this is the uh, ABO gene which determines uh, blood type, right? So in this case, the alleles are either A, B, O, three of them, right? So that leads to six possible genotypes. Order doesn't matter, right? So here, here are the the six different genotypes and the corresponding phenotype. So AA, AB, and so on, and the blood type, right? Genotype, phenotype, and as you can see here that uh, there are multiple genotypes that can lead to the same phenotype. So blood type A could be either the alleles AA or AO, right? In this particular case, the relationship between the genotype and the phenotype was deterministic. You tell me what the genotype is, I tell you what the phenotype. But that is not always the case. It's possible that uh, we may have a probabilistic relationship. Here's an example. Here's a gene that has two alleles, H and D, healthy and, and, and uh, have a disease. <clears throat> the, the, the first two combination lead to healthy. The last combination, DD, is ill with probability 0.5. And that's known as the uh, penetrance. Um, so again, it's either deterministic or uh, probabilistic. So you, you could already now start seeing the how this is going to come out as a Bayesian network, right? We'll, we'll see in a little bit. OK, now we're going to do one more. Couple, there's a key concept that's going to come in here which is going to be the, the one that will give us the information about the extent to which certain things are linked or not genes. Okay. First, this notion, the haplotype. So the alleles received by an individual from one parent is called the haplotype. Right? So as you saw now, for, for a particular individual, every gene has two components, right? One from the parent from the father and the other from the mother. So if you take the string that was obtained from one of them, that's called the haplotype, right? So that's one component per gene. Now, uh, looking back at this example, right? So remember, we have two genes here. And, and try to realize that for gene 1, the two alleles are big A and small a. For gene 2, the alleles are big B and small b. OK, look at this. If you look at Mary, and you see the genotype for Mary, the only haplotype it can send to a child is big A, big B. That's it. Because she's going to choose one of the alleles for G1 and one of the alleles for G2. OK, now look at John. Similarly, there's only one haplotype that they can send to a child, correct? Small a, small b. Now look at Jack, though. That's a different situation. How many haplotypes? Four. For the first gene, it could be big A or small a. And for the second gene, it could be big B or small b, any combination. That's four of them. So now we're getting to the bottom line of where we're going to get the evidence from. This haplotype, right, and that were received from his parents, right? But the haplotypes were not. Look at Jack. Mary would send A, B, right? That's this guy. John sent this guy. Correct? Jack can send all of these four. Two of these are the ones they got directly from either Mary or John. Right? But the other two were not obtained purely from either Mary or from John. Got, right? These guys, some of them come from Mary and some from... You guys see that? When something like this happened, we say that a recombination event took place. Now, OK, this is the bottom line here. <clears throat> if Jack were to pass on the haplotype this, 
then part of this haplotype would have come from Mary and the other from John. A recombination event has occurred between the two genes, G1 and G2, and the child receiving this haplotype is a recombinant. We're good so far? The bottom line is going to be that whether this happens or not between these two genes or the extent to which or the probability of it happening depends on how close or far they are on a chromosome. <clears throat> As you can imagine, the closer they are, the unlikely this will happen. Now, look at this example. Lydia, if you look carefully, Lydia, she must be a recombinant. By looking at her genotype, she must be a recombinant. Look, look at the reasoning. If Lydia was not a recombinant, she must have received haplotype AB, big AB, or small AB from Jack. Correct? As we saw before. And haplotype small a, small b from Sue. That's the only thing that Sue can pass. In that case, Lydia's genotype would have been either this or that, just looking at the possibility. But Lydia has neither of these. <clears throat> she must be a recombinant. The extent to which gene 1 and g 2 are linked is measured by a recombination fraction of frequency theta, which is the probability that the recombination between them will occur. Uh, half means they are not linked, less than half means they're linked. And at the end, the way we're going to use the Bayesian network that we're going to create is by making inferences on what theta is. So someone comes and says, I think theta is that versus this, and we try to assess which one is more supported by the evidence we have. Remember, what's the evidence? The network itself, which is constructed from the pedigree, and then the phenotype and genotype that we, we know about uh, this. And this is the picture I alluded to earlier is this is how things look physically and the thetas in a way are correlated with the distances so we're reasoning about the thetas but the goal is to try to say something about the actual distance between these guys on the chromosome now let's look at how this comes together it's fun but just before we do that uh, let me remind you of the big picture of how we're going to use this here's how we're going to use it <clears throat> We're going to build the Bayesian network, synthesized from the pedigree. And then you're going to come and say, wait a minute, here's the evidence I have. I observed some genotypes and phenotypes of some of these individuals. And then I, we have two particular thetas, pick two genes, and then someone's saying, oh, it's theta, the recombination frequency. And someone says, no, it's theta prime. So I want to try to find which one is the one that is more likely. So here's what we're going to do. You're going to see that the thetas will end up being parameters in the Bayesian network. So I have the Bayesian network structure G together with the parameters theta that contains this particular frequency. And I use it to compute the probability of the evidence of seeing that genotype and phenotype, right? And then I take that network and replace theta by theta prime. New hypothesis. And I do something similar, compute the probability of the evidence. And basically, I favor the one that leads, maximizes the probability of the evidence that I'm seeing which is the phenotype and the genotype. That's basically what's going on here. So now let's look at the network, right? Uh, I, I will put the structure for it. <clears throat> it's going to be, for a very simple pedigree, two parents and one offspring and three genes, and then we'll explain it. It, it makes a lot of sense. As you will see, it looks hairy here, but it's uh, quite sensical, as you see. And, and let me just say that this is a very small thing. The actual ones that you get from real genetic analysis problems end up having uh, tens of thousands of nodes, the, the actual uh, nodes. So what's going on here? We have three individuals. Uh, the, the father, the mother, and then the child. So one, two, and three. In this case, uh, we call these founders because in the pedigree, they don't have parents, right? They're roots. And uh, we have three, the three um, genes that we're thinking about, one, two, and three as well. And now let's see what's going on here with this file. So we need to understand the variables. We don't have too many variables here. There's a lot of indices, but not too many variables. So we start here. Right? Let's look at the fragment here. <clears throat> uh, this is the gene, and there is P and M, paternal and maternal, right? So the paternal allele for individual and maternal allele. So for this particular individual, uh, one of these is, is the allele they got from the 
father and the other from the mother, right? And the third variable is the phenotype. We've seen that, correct? So for blood type, right? The P would be the blood type and the parents would be the two alleles for that. Pretty straightforward, correct? And as you know, in this case, the CPT for the P will either be 0, 1 if it was a deterministic phenotype or if there's penetrance, it will be probabilistic. Okay, good. And, and look, this recurs. First gene, second gene, and so on for this guy as well, and for this individual as well. So that explains a big portion of this network. Okay, here's the other two interesting variables. In fact, that's everything, right? There's only two more variables left here, which are, which are here, the SP and the SM. Correct? Look what's going on here. Ignore this variable for now. Look at the, this particular variable, the GP, what is it? Three, one, right? What are the parents? These two guys. What does that mean? Well, what is this? This is the allele for this parent that they got from their father, correct? It could be either copied from here or copied from there, correct? If it was copied from here, then the child will be getting it from the grandfather, correct? It was this guy, then the child is getting it from the grandmother. Okay, so what is this variable here? Determines how individual I inherits alleles of gene I from his father. That is, this has two values, P and M. If the value of this guy is P, then we're copying from the grandfather. If the value of this guy is P, is M, we're copying from the grandmother. So it's like a selector, selecting. What am I doing the copying from? And similarly for this guy. Right? Determines how individual, so straightforward. And um, this is what I basically just said in this case. If this guy is P, I'm copying from the grandfather, otherwise I'm copying from the grandfather. We're not done yet. There's one more thing. Okay? Suppose that, look at these three guys. <clears throat> There's three of them, right? This guy's saying, where am I copying the first gene from? This guy's saying, where am I copying the second gene from? And so on, correct? Now, let's say that all of these happen to have the value P. All of them happen to the value P. What am I doing in that case? This guy is getting the haplotype from the grandfather. That is, I'm, I'm copying this whole strand here, correct? And if all of these guys were M, what am I doing? I'm getting from the grandmother, all of this strand consistently, correct? But let's say this is P and this is M. Then that's a recombination. I'm copying the first gene from one place, and I'm copying the other from the other place. See that? In fact, and this is the critical point here, the CPT for this guy, what is it going to be like? It's going to say, what is the property that this is P given that the parent is P? What is the property that this is M given that the parent is P? This CPT will encode what? The recombination frequency. That's where it will go. We'll see them in just a little bit. Okay, so we're going to go over the CPTs of these, these things. And there's one CPT, basically all of them are almost what you'd expect, and there's one that captures our hypothesis. Now, a little bit about these, these CPTs. For the founders, I am, uh, the founders are these guys, that in the pedigree I don't have parents for them. Uh, the, the CPTs on these guys, which is what kind of alleles they tend to have, they're usually obtained from population statistics collected by geneticists. This is part of the field. Uh, now, for the phenotypes, we've already talked about this, right? The CPTs for the phenotypes, we talked about this, either deterministic or probabilistic, as we've seen areas earlier ba based on uh, penetrance. And the non-founders, now we're talking about this guy, right? Uh, for the genes themselves, uh, G, P, and G, M, those will also be deterministic because they're like circuits, right? They're gates. They're, they're copying zeros and ones. From the semantics we discussed, you can figure these out. 
there's no ambiguity here. And the only thing that's now left basically are these particular guys. Right? So we're looking at this guy here, given the parent. And in this case, where we discussed that in both cases we're copying from the father. In this case, we're both copying from the mother. This is one, this is the case where you have a recombination. You were copying from the father and then you're not copying from the mother. And that happens with this particular probability. This is the recombination frequency between gene 1 and gene 2. Right? And in this case, that's the recombination frequency between uh, 1 and 2 as well. And this is 1 minus 1 minus. So this assumes that we already know a total order of these guys. Right? This is the first, this is the second. And then we have these gaps. Between them. That's, that's basically it. And now that you have this, you, you have this network, <clears throat> you plug in some values for thetas, and you come and say, look, I have this particular genotype, and I have this particular um, phenotype, and then you go ahead and compute the probability of seeing that. That represents the likelihood of the recombination frequencies that are included in the network. And um, by changing the CPTs for the selector variables, uh, which hosts the recombination frequencies, then I can recompute this and evaluate various hypotheses. Typically, people do this. Uh, you have a particular guy you want to evaluate. You compute this with respect to <coughs> half, linked, unlinked. And um, there is more things you can do. People sometimes search for these things and so on, but that's beyond the point here. Uh, yeah, let me say that Chapter 5 has uh, these case studies. And queries that we already did I have more on what I'm going to talk about next, but I'll just select one subject and talk about it. And also has a component on sensitivity analysis, uh, which we'll leave till later when we talk about sensitivity analysis. So the one thing that I'm going to talk about is what happens when you have too many parents per node in a Bayesian network, right? And this does come up. It's um, not to be underestimated. And you see the problem. Here's an example of, uh, we're talking about binary variables and the number of parents and what happens to 2 to the n, which is the size of the CPT. So clearly, that's going to be problematic when you have too many parents, not just from a computational point of view, but also from a learning point of view, estimating these parameters or trying to specify them manually. So people have been looking at solutions for this. And the one, there's a class of solutions that work by saying, Wait a minute. You're talking about a variable x that has a whole bunch of parents. If we assume that x is related to its parents in a specific way, then we can probably specify the CPT non-exponential. So I'll show you this example. You see it's very nice and intuitive. But before I dig into that model, which we will end up with, I will tell you that there's another class of solutions to this problem, which do not assume a specific model. Say, okay, I can help you with this. And I can, in fact, allow you to work with Bayesian networks where nodes have too many parents. And I can still do it in efficiently in some cases. And I don't want to assume anything about the model. We will do one of these later. And we will talk about something called the conditional PSDD, which is a particular representation for CPTs that are meant for that. That's actually in the very last lecture on structured Bayesian networks which uh, was targeted to this particular problem. So let's look at what we have here. I have a node E, and it has a bunch of, think of it as causes, parents. This thing is called a noisy model that I'm describing. The, the word noisy, mo noisy or model is in the literature. And my interpretation of the noisy or model is this. Now stare at this for a second and see what's going on. We know what this is, an AND gate. C is the cause, one of the causes. Q, we introduced it. We're going to give it a name. We're going to call it a suppressor of C1. We know what this is. This means that take Q1, negate it before you feed it into the AND gate, correct? And the same for C2. Cause and suppressor and so on. And then there is this guy. This is an OR. Think about it. What would cause E to trigger. All of these are on off. Would C1 trigger E if the suppressor is of C1 is not active? So 
So here's the moral. The moral is you have a bunch of causes. Each one of them can cause the event, make it happen. Except that there are some things that if materialized, they prohibit that cause from achieving that objective. So typically the, the cues or the suppressors would be low probability things. Now, what's L? L is called the leak. It's all other things that may cause the event, but I don't want to talk about them explicitly. I just want to summarize them and lump them into one node. Uh, looking at this, what numbers do I need to quantify the noisy or model? For every suppressor, I need the probability, correct? And I need the probability for the leak. So that's n plus 1 parameters. Okay, now I'm going to show you how from these n plus 1 parameters you can synthesize the whole CPT. So these are the parameters that we have, right? Look at the notation. I'm going to use this notation. Q, uh, theta sub Q, that means the probability that this suppressor is active. And this guy is the probability that the leak is active. Now, simple derivation, one slide. But I need this notation. Let alpha be an instantiation of the causes. And I'm going to say that this notation, I sub alpha, will be the indices of the causes that are active in alpha. For example, if alpha is this. Here we're talking about a noisy or model with five causes, right? Here's alpha. First cause, active, active, passive, passive, active. Good. So what is this guy? One, two, and five. The guys that are active. Look what we're going to do. It's easier to compute the probability that E did not trigger, given alpha. Now you look at this guy. If I tell you this is what happened, that is one, two, five are active, but still the cause did not trigger. What does that mean? The suppressor for this was active. The suppressor for this was active. The suppressor for this was active. And moreover, the leak they didn't materialize. Correct? Four things. That's this guy. This is the leak. One minus theta L, that's the leak they didn't materialize. And what am I doing here? Multiplying the property of all of the suppressors that correspond to active causes. See the index there? You guys get it? And then the probability of active is just one minus that. Done. Here's a complete example. Sore throat has three causes, cold, flu, and tonsillitis. I'm going to assume a noisy or model between these guys. And I'm giving you the following suppressor probabilities. For cold, 15%, 1%, 5%, and the leak probability is 2%. Right? You just plug into the equation. And from these five numbers, you establish the whole CPT for this particular guy. Now, let me just say that this is just an example. People have proposed other things. There's something called the noisy and model. Uh, there is another version of the noisy or model with a little bit of slightly different semantics. Um, but what I gave you is basically the standard. Again, this gives you uh, an example of how this game is played by assuming a particular interaction model, or what we call a micro-model, between a node and its parents, and therefore giving you something more specialized that can be specified more compactly. And later, we'll talk about more general uh, models for CPTs. You have to realize that there's two dimensions to this game as well. Uh, one of them is the modeling part, right? How do I specify the model with a small number of parameters and the impact that that may have on modeling effort and learning. But there's the other dimension, which is inference. The standard algorithms we're going to work with, with starting this coming lecture, uh, typically work with uh, tabular representations, with CPTs. People have investigated this for a very long time. Now, you come and say, oh, I'm going to use this guy instead. Then what do you have to do? If you say, I will transform it into a CPT and then send it to the other algorithm, you're not being as, as, as efficient as you can, right? If you want to work with this more compact representation, the burden is on you now to come up with modified algorithms that operate on these creatures instead. Anyways, this would be it uh, for today. Uh, and uh, next time, we will start with chapter 6, where we will discuss our first inference algorithms. I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you.